السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم On behalf of the Board of Trustees, the faculty, staff, and students, I'd like to welcome you all to the commencement ceremony of our graduating class of 2022, which has now begun. So please be seated. الحمد لله نحمد الله سبحانه وتعالى ونشكره praise God and express our gratitude to our Lord and Creator, Sustainer of the heavens and the earth, all things living and inanimate. And we ask God to bless this gathering. الحمد لله welcome family, friends, supporters. The last two years have been very trying times for us. I think one of these solaces that we can find in it is the fact that that tribulation uh, affected the whole planet. It wasn't simply uh, an individual trial, which happens, but when everybody shares in a tribulation, it certainly makes it lighter uh, because it's, it's a collective trial, and so we can support one another. In, a, in many ways, the uh, the response to the plague, and plagues are very interesting. We think, when we think of plagues, we really think of the, the, something in the past. But plagues are part of the human experience. And Ibn Khaldun wrote his great Muqaddimah as a result of witnessing what the devastating plague of the 14th century did to the lands, obviously in Europe, but certainly in the Muslim lands. He said it changed everything. And in many ways, the, the plague has changed everything. Hindsight's always 2020, they say, and I think in many ways uh, the overreaction was quite devastating on a lot of our young people. I saw it with my own uh, children who were in their last years of high school, the effects of being online for several hours a day. And I don't think that we've really taken into consideration the effect that it had on so many people. The uh, Nonetheless, we obeyed the scientists and took their advice. We masked our faces, which certainly gave criminals an interesting perspective. Um, it was also interesting to see France, who had outlawed the face mask, um, being forced to wear it in uh, Toto. So, <laughs> um, But Putin invaded U Ukraine, and suddenly it seemed like he had solved the COVID problem because everything changed after that. So here we are. We have three classes here today, by the way. And we made a mistake because this is our smallest graduating class. And um, I, I did, mm, was tempted to rent a crowd. Uh, uh, but I will say that uh, it, it's, it's a good class. And uh, like the Jewish poet Samo Al said, you know, they, they find fault in us that we're few, but I remind them that noble people are always few. So, the, um, the class of 20 and 20, 2020 and 2021, some of them are here, and uh, the Graduate Theological Union actually had them walk with their students. So, if you could just rise uh, for people that are here from those two classes, if anybody's here. Yeah, so if you could just give them a... And then we also, one of the Zaytuna family, I don't know if Luis is here, Albares, is Luis here? He's, he, Luis is... Uh, a dear member of the family and his father, Javier, is really a blessing to have here. But Luis got his master's degree. And also Dr. Hosseini got her PhD. So we, we have, have had people here that are, uh, despite the COVID, were able to do things. In fact, possibly because of COVID, I was able to finish a dissertation that I've been working on for 10 years because I wasn't traveling anymore and I didn't really have an excuse. So. Um, our graduates stay in the BA program. Um, they have, I think, persevered online their sophomore and junior years. We lost a few along the way. Uh, 
Um, but uh, they're, I think, blessed with the fact that we've actually changed the degree title to better reflect what we do here at Zaytuna. So it's actually a, a, a degree in liberal arts and Islamic studies. And the reason for that is because we are really attempting to do the liberal arts here. And obviously there's a lot of pe people that make jokes about liberal arts degrees. So you've probably heard a lot of them, you know, how do you get a liberal arts major off your porch, pay him for the pizza, right? I mean, these ha ha ha, um, you know, uh, the engineering major asks, how does it work? The, the uh, business major asks, how much is it worth? The science major asks, why is it worth? The li liberal arts major asks, do you want fries with that burger? Ha, ha, ha. You know, a liberal arts major, um, you know, what has four wheels and doesn't go anywhere? A liberal arts major. I lied about the wheels. Ha, ha, ha. You know, what's the difference between a philosophy major and a liberal arts major? The philosophy major will ask you why you're choosing paper over plastic, ha, ha, ha. You know, so why don't you have a liberal arts college next to a post office? I made this one up. Uh, because the students will protest that the category male is a social construct. Uh, someone said to me, what do you love? Do what you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. So I got a liberal arts degree, ha, ha, ha. Um, Anyway, you get the point, right? What did the chickpea study at the liberal arts college? Falafelfy, right? <laughs> yeah. So there's a whole bunch of them and they make fun of uh, liberal arts majors. But the reality of it is uh, the liberal arts actually built this country. Uh, the liberal arts gave Europe a supremacy over many places. The abandonment of the liberal arts in the Muslim uh, community is arguably one of the major reasons for the decline of Muslim civilization. The fact that liberal arts degrees still represent, despite the fact they're less than 3% of the degrees in this country, they represent almost 20% of the most influential people in the United States. So people can laugh at liberal arts, but the reality of it is the liberal arts is real and it's powerful. And the very first art that is learned, and you can see this in, uh, in that famous fresco that hangs in Paris that uh, Botticelli did where it shows a, a liberal arts student being held in a personification, a beautiful woman personified, personifying grammar. And he's being ushered into uh, the other six liberal arts who are all personified as beautiful women. The idea that men studied and you should pursue the arts like a man pursues uh, a woman in other words, fall in love and then woo her until she succumbs to you. Um, that's the old fashioned way of doing things. I know things are different these days, but anyway, that's the way people used to do it. So um, grammar is really important. My teacher, Marab Tarhaj, wrote two major works, both in grammar. And I realized later that I think he was doing that because he realized that to really have any revival of a civilization or a tradition, you have to begin in the beginning, which is grammar. Those who possess grammar, logic, and rhetoric, they have advantages over other people for good and ill. The good use of these arts is to fight for truth, justice, and to redress wrongs in the courts and from the pulpits and podiums. The evil use of the arts is for manipulation, for propaganda, through sophistry. Why were free blacks in the US denied the right to study grammar? I mean, it's a very interesting question. It was illegal to teach grammar. You, uh, slaves in this country could be taught to read, but they were not allowed to be taught the rules of grammar. I mean, it's very interesting. The great reformer, David Walker, who Imam Zaid uh, informed me that uh, had actually met with uh, uh, Amir Abdurrahman, so he had an uh, impact on him. He memorized uh, Murray's Grammar, which was one of the most important books in early American history. And it was a book that Abraham Lincoln had memorized also. It was a grammar book. Walker wrote a famous uh, pamphlet, An Appeal to Colored Citizens of the World, in which he condemned slavery and its abuses and the people that were abusing uh, blacks in this country. But his appeal in the book was to study grammar and that, that his people needed to study grammar as a liberating force. 
And that when oppressed people acquire grammar, they acquire a power that without it they don't have. This is something that the, 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 the Marxist ideologue from South America, Paulo Freire, understood very well in his Pedagogy of the Oppressed. You know, one of the things about oppressed people is they don't have even the language to articulate what they're experiencing. So they can only feel resentment and frustration. My father used to say that obscenity is always uh, the, the, the refuge of people that don't have words to express what's in their, in their heart. And so they, they go to the default setting of, a, of an obscenity and look how they pro proliferated. But it's not just for power that we learn these arts, and they are powerful. We also learn them for the preservation of our civilization, our culture, and its stability. Milton, in a letter to an Italian grammarian, wrote, it is Plato's opinion that an alteration in the style and fashion of dress portends grave disorders and changes in the state. It's very interesting that the 1960s had a massive change in the way people dressed in this country. But here's what Milton says. I would maintain rather that when language falls into corruption and decay, the downfall of the state and a period of degradation and obscurity are at hand. For it is not the use of words which are illiterate and mean, incorrect in form. For is it not the use of words which are illiterate and mean, like vulgar and low, incorrect in form or wrongly pronounced, a very clear indication of a slothful and sluggish disposition among people and a proneness to submit to any form of slavery. These arts are called liberal from the Latin liber, which interestingly enough means both free, but it also means book, iqra. Another reason why these arts are so essential is that they teach people how to define and put limits on meanings. Humpty Dumpty, which is a book, uh, it, it was, which is in a, a book that was written by a logician. A lot of people don't know that. Lewis Carroll actually taught logic. And he wanted to write a story for young people to understand what a world without logic looks like. That's what through the looking glass. And that's why we are through the looking glass. So what would that world look like? Well, Humpty Dumpty gives us uh, a very insightful expression of what that world will be. So Humpty Dumpty uses the word glory, and Alice queries, I don't know what you mean by glory, said Alice. Humpty Dumpty smiled contemptuously. Of course you don't, till I tell you what it means. I meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you, Alice says, but glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Man, woman, marriage, what do these words mean? What do they mean? God, state, law, authority, if we don't give meanings to these, you know, de Gaulle said, how do you rule a people that have 246 types of cheese? How do a people communicate that now have 78 pronouns? So who is to be master? I would argue those who master the liberal arts. The truth will always be a bargain in the marketplace of ideas. Societies do go mad, historically, many have and many will continue to do so. People also go mad. Nietzsche pointed out, and I think accurately, that, that very often madness is quite rare in individuals, but it's the norm in groups. And I think the Quran is test testimony to that because the Quran is a book of individuals going, going up against group madness. There's no rightly guided group in the Quran. It's all individuals. The truth will always be a bargain in the marketplace of ideas. So the word for sanity is from a Latin word which means health. Health is from an Anglo-Saxon word which means whole. You can't be whole, in other words, you can't be truly sane without being whole, meaning integrated in body, soul, and mind, and most importantly, the heart, which if sound, according to our Prophet if it's whole, it's healthy and the whole being is healthy. 
on the day when nothing avails them save those who bring a sound heart to God. God lifted us with the human heart. We return that gift by protecting our hearts from the snares and tribulations of this world, but by polishing it also, because by the nature of the world, the heart will oxidize. The Prophet ﷺ said, everything rusts. Kulu shayin yasda. Everything rusts, and the heart rusts, which in scientific terms is oxidizes. We now know that there are these, anti these, these, these antioxidants that uh, in, in the body that you can actually protect your body from this oxidation occurring. But dhikr is the way that our prophet gave us to protect our spiritual hearts from rusting, from oxidizing. And we polish it until the, with the remembrance of God until it perfectly refre, reflects the attributes of God in the Imago Dei in which we were made. So in conclusion, we're certainly living in strange times, but one of the great blessings of an education rooted in the best of the past from all our great tributaries that flow into this river we call civilization is a recognition that every age is strange. We band of believers, we're strangers in this world. If you don't feel strange, The, uh, the, 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 the poet said, Inna la fi zamanan li farti shududihi man la yujadninuhu falaysa bi'aqili. We're living in an age of such madness, if it doesn't drive you mad, you weren't sane to begin with. So, the Prophet reminded us, blessed are the strangers, the alienated ones, those who know the world is not their country. We're here on tourist visas. Do good, obey the laws, be upright, be virtuous, leave it in a better condition that you found it, hopefully. But they're, they're temporary visas. Like the man who uh, got into paradise and he asked uh, the angel if he could just visit hell. He said, you're in paradise, you can do whatever you want. So he, he got to visit hell and it was fantastic. He met all these amazing people, <laughs> had a great time, he went back. He said, yeah, can I visit it again? He said, you can do it, yeah. He goes back, even better time. Third time he tells him, mm, you have to stay there. So he goes there and then the devil takes him to the hottest place in hell. He said, oh, I had such a good time, the first two visits. He said, no, no, that was a temporary visa. This is permanent residence. <laughs> so. So it's a tradition to leave students with some advice, and I know our brother Tobias has some great advice for you, but I, I'll leave you with a few things from three sources, our book, our prophet, and my favorite scholar from our tradition. From the book, two points to sum of everything you need to know for your personal life and your social interaction. The first for your personal life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ وَصَّيْنَا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْرِكُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ أَنِ اتَّقُوا اللَّهِ that we have counseled you and those who were given the book before you to be dutifully aware of your obligations to God, to be conscientious. And then one for all of your social interactions. There's no, there's no good in most of your private conversations except among those who enjoin to charity enjoin call others to virtue, and reconcile among humanity. Be people, peacemakers. And then from our Prophet ﷺ, a man said, give me advice, awsini ya Rasulullah. And he said three times, la uh, taghdab, don't get angry. Don't let your emotions control you. Part of the purpose of this type of education is that you actually become the rider and don't let your beast ride you which is your lower self. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, say, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِلَهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِيمْ Say, I believe in God, and then be virtuous, be upright. And God has made us upright creatures. We're not like animals that walk on all fours, although we can become like that. And finally, my last piece of advice is one of the best things that I've ever read from our tradition, and it's from Sidi Ahmed Zarruq. And he makes, this is an axiom for him, it's a principle. He says, the uniqueness of God, most high, in being perfect, decrees the existence of imperfection in every created thing. 
So there is no perfection unless God perfects. God's perfecting is a result of God's grace and bounty. So imperfection is essential. Perfection is accidental. Hence, to seek perfection in this world is vanity. Thus it has been said, look at people as if they were perfect, but consider the imperfection of their nature. If perfection appears in them, it is from the grace of God. Otherwise, imperfection is the norm. Based upon this view of the world, prudence, good feelings, and camaraderie, and overlooking the mistakes of others can occur. This is how the world should be dealt with. Imam al-Junaid said, I have taken as an axiomatic principle in my life through which I no longer find anything repulsive in this world, and it is this. The world is an abode of distress, anxiety, trials, tribulations, and strife, and its nature is entirely deficient. Its decree is to assail me with everything that I find unpleasant or detestable. Hence, if, one, if I encounter this world with things that I love and enjoy, I know that it is from the bounty of God. Otherwise, the norm is as I have stated. So this is the world that we're in. It's a trial and a tribulation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, bless this uh, cohort and also the previous two cohorts and all of our graduates inshallah and uh, we just uh, hope inshallah that we've uh, we've benefited them and for our shortcomings we would ask them patience and forgiveness thank you <laughs>